Hello, everyone, and welcome to CodeCast by SDL Tech Talk, where we're going to bring you the content you want and need, instructional, informative, unique, and insightful commentary on programming and technology. Coming to you live from Robots and Roadhouses, my name is JJ Hammond, and I am joined tonight by two coding experts. Up first, our guest, he is the founder of BitNative LLC, an agile software development and training consultancy, and creator of OutlierDeveloper.com, a community for software developers who aspire to be exceptional. He is a Pluralsight author, Microsoft MVP and C Sharp, and Netta speaker, independent consultant, and blogger with 15 years experience in full stack software development. As a software architect at Venn Solutions, he has specialized in creating c .NET, and JavaScript-based single-page applications for the automotive industry. He regularly speaks and coaches teams on clean code, architecture, and software career development at conferences and user groups across the country and internationally. He is a multiple Pluralsight course, has multiple Pluralsight courses, including clean code, writing code for humans, which I've checked out, totally awesome, architecting applications for realworld.in.net, and becoming an outlier on Pluralsight. Corey, the outlier, welcome to the show. <laughs> Aspiring outlier, we'll go with that. Thanks for having me, JJ. No, thank you for being on the show. It is our pleasure, sir. And speaking of our, however, this show is not possible without the coolest guy I know striving to bring development knowledge to the masses and has spent the last 20 years architecting and implementing highly scalable ASP.NET applications, our very own Gus Emery. Say hello, Gus. Hey, JJ. Corey, glad to see you again. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, Gus. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Absolutely. I'm ready for a fantastic show, and I'm sure you guys are, too. And don't forget, everyone, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag CodeCast, or at STL CodeCast. Also, you can find our stuff on Facebook, Google+, subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Windows Phone, TuneIn Radio, or listen directly from the site. And you can watch us live from the site. Plus, download our Windows Phone 8 application, not right this second, but right after the show. Download it then so that you can listen to it and, and, and check it out as well. Don't forget to visit the site to keep up with our tech news, our podcast, our codecast, and find out how you can advertise with us and give us money, because who doesn't want that, or hire us to consult you on your technological needs. Don't forget you can interact with the live show by sending us feedback to podcast at stltechtalk.com. And if you're watching us live, you can ask us questions via the chat room, and we'll do our best to answer those questions in a timely manner. A special thank you goes out tonight to the place that I'm coming uh, broadcasting from. It's the Unconventional Workspace for Unconventionally Unemployed. Oh, wait, I'm saying that wrong. The Unconventionally <laughs> Employed. Nebula Coworking provides space for creative professionals, small businesses, independent contractors, artists, and nonprofits looking to build uh, creative and collaborative workspaces. I couldn't have jacked that up even more if I tried. But everybody go to nebulastl.com or just type it into a search engine. If you're in the St. Louis area, and if you want to go to a really cool, interactive, just a really nice working environment, they literally have Super Mario Brothers playing on a TV just like right in the next room just to, just to kind of go and show you that if you want to blow off some steam and kill yourself on Mario a couple of times like I did, uh, go, come over and check them out. They're really cool. Also, I uh, wanted to say thank you to uh, uh, Unidev and everything that they're doing with us, as well as our last uh, guest last night, which was Sam Sullivan. He's a programmer for trackbill.com. We can't thank him enough for being on the show. So without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off the show with the first question to Corey. What got you started in technology, sir? Well, uh, I have a story that's a little bit different than most developers. Um, I remember starting out, uh, I've always been big into cars, and uh, I remember starting out wanting to goof around with creating a website about my car. Uh, so mm -hmm. I really got started in earnest in development, uh, really with the web, when the web was in its infancy, and I remember this was around 97 or so when I was doing this, uh, maybe 96. Before that, I'd used uh, Pascal, and I had a history toying around with Commodore 64s like a lot of people, that sort of thing. But really, programming in earnest started out with me with just plain old uh, HTML and then spending a lot of time um, in Flash. Sure. And 
that was a lot of fun, and I, I, I remember thinking about 99, uh, once my Flash skills had gotten pretty good, I, I was really hoping that was going to take the web by storm and kill off nasty old HTML. We didn't need it. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it turned out I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turned out I was wrong. I, I've bet on the wrong technology nearly every time. So uh, I was the same story. I didn't think the Blu-ray would win. I thought HD DVD was was going to take off and spent five hundred dollars on one of those players a couple years ago. Um, so I'm really yeah I'm lousy at guessing what the future holds. Apparently. Well, you know what um, that that happens. Hey, so a lot of our our viewers are actually car guys. So what kind of a car did you have back then? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, I wish I had a picture of me sitting in it. So uh, it was my grandmother's car that I bought for $500, and it was a 1980 Datsun 210, bright oh. orange with white sheepskin seat covers, and then a four-speed stick on the floor, had an AM radio, and then one speaker right in the middle of the dash was the only, it was <laughs> hideous. That's awesome. The only nice thing was I knew any girl that was dating me really liked me. It wasn't the car at all that attracted her. So yeah, <laughs> no, you weren't one of those, right? Yeah. One of the <laughs> yeah, it's the car that got the chick. So yeah. gosh, I don't think you've ever told our listeners what your first car was because I'm going to blow all your minds with mine. I I, I will be glad to tell you, tell everyone. Um, my first car was actually a Volkswagen Bug, 1974 Super Beetle, in lemon yellow. How about yours, JJ? So my first car was a 1998 Cavalier, and it had no rims on it. That you know, the the, the rims, the plastic ones that had fallen off, so they were oh, yeah. black. You know, they were down to the bare bones, right? Steelies, every, man. Everybody called me Stealth Mode um, <laughs> because uh, you could barely see me coming because my car was like pretty black too and all beat up and nasty. So, like, I was all stealth mode. So that was my <laughs> first car. That's what I started off with. I upgraded to a Camaro, but I started oh. I got my humble roots, right? Yeah. Uh, so what kind of Camaro did you get? Oh, I got a, uh, it was a 90, I want to say it was one of the classic editions. It was the 25th anniversary edition uh, yeah. with T-tops and uh, chameleon paint job. So. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Flashy. Yeah, I know. Was, I can't help it. Here. This kind of way I roll, and especially when you start off and you're trying to get girls to come into a beat-up Cavalier that barely makes it down the street and that's a stick shift, uh, <laughs> you got to learn some game. Uh, let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. So, uh, so Corey, since we're, we're talking about uh, one of your topics tonight that uh, I, I have enjoyed over the years anyway and, and have listened to and completely agree with, with most of everything that you say. What is an outlier? Oh, an outlier. Well, it, it's funny. I've had people that weren't from America ask me that, too, because it's really a statistical reference, first and foremost, and this idea of, hey, we've got this data point that doesn't fit in with the rest of uh, these this uh, data set that we have. And in the same token, an outlier is really someone that sticks out from the crowd somehow. And when I use it in terms of uh, the course and of my, my talks that I give on this topic, it's really about uh, standing out in a good way, about being exceptional based on the number of years experience that you have or on this little niche that you've selected or perhaps in the amount of money that you're making or in the impact you're making in the world. There's a lot of different ways to, to classify yourself as an outlier, but really the, the common thread is being somebody that, that is uh, remarkable, is exceptional, is um, noteworthy within their peer group. And was the origin of this Malcolm Gladwell's book then? I read Malcolm Gladwell's book uh, shortly after it came out and it absolutely uh, changed the way that I thought about a lot of things. Uh, now, as, as far as the, the content in my conversation, there's very little that, that comes from that except, except this conversation about 10,000 hours, which I've come to realize I read the book uh, Talent is Overrated. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. and I really like that title too and I, I came to realize I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell got a lot of inspiration from that book too. And, and the funny thing was there were, there were previous studies that are referenced in both of those books. But that, that real core idea of just recognizing that I'd go to conferences and I'd go to user groups and i hang out with these people and I'd so often come back and I'd feel like, wow, there's just there's so many brilliant people and I, I don't see how I'm ever going to compete. How can I keep up? And what you recognize from those books is 
don't look at these people with the halo like they're just naturally smarter than you. Recognize that in most cases they've just simply practiced different things than you have and they've worked really hard to get there. This this idea of innate talent is is really something that holds people back and causes us to, to really have a fixed mindset on life. And as long as you can get that habit of thinking, I just need to have a growth mindset and each day I need to learn a little bit more and you can find yourself radically better um, in a pretty short period. Yeah, I, you can apply that to anything, anything. I mean, it, it's crazy. In fact, uh, a user group that I, I just came from before I came here today um, to, to be on the show was interesting because when you meet new developers for the first time, you're like, how am I ever going to stand out? How am I ever going to like get the job or bid for jobs or whatever the case may be is because you realize that there's a lot of people. But it's the same thing with music or anything else is you have to practice your craft. And I think that that does not translate a lot of the times when you tell people, look, these guys are good as they are because that's all they do. You know what I mean? Sometimes. And, and or they took the time out. They said, you know what? Instead of going out and getting hammered on a weekend, I'm just going to sit down and code something out or whatever the case may be. Is. And you could apply that to all sorts of different things. But the, the, the main focus is to do something and jack it up. Know that you know, you're going to make a whole bunch of mistakes, but just learn from those experiences and just keep going. Right on. Yeah, I mean, I think about in college, I was big into playing acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. And I remember learning the first five or six chords, and I realized, man, I can pretty much play along with the radio with almost anything that comes on. And I don't sure. sound as good as they do, but I can play the right chords to, to go along. And what happened was I got really good that first year when I was practicing that. And then I played for the next two or three years a lot. And the problem was I never tried finger picking much. I never really tried playing classical guitar. I never learned barring very well because I was hard. And we do that same thing as developers. We get we get 50% uh, there, 60% there. We know the basics. We're, we're good enough that we can do our jobs. But um, And a lot of people stop at that point. Right. Uh, and, and that's... Um, there's not anything necessarily wrong with that because maybe you want to be somebody who's known for their breadth rather than their depth. Sure. Uh, but it, it's probably easiest to make a mark for yourself if you can choose this little niche and get really good at it and, and be known as the person that really knows Azure or really knows C Sharp or I mean you think about like John Skeet is somebody everybody knows John Skeet's name because he is he knows C Sharp inside and out and has made that his brand and he's completely honest about the fact that he doesn't know UI development that's not his thing he's not really strong on data databases and data access but he knows the business layer and how to really craft things in that language and that makes him somebody that everybody looks up to because he's really good at that specific thing. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah that, is, awesome. that is true. Uh, and you know there, there, there are two different types of people that I think corporations look for. Both are outliers in my opinion and Corey you can, you can tell me that I'm cr completely crazy if you want to but one is that person that is the John Skeet of the world, right? Knows one thing really, really, really well. And the second one is somebody that knows everything enough to be able to uh, you know, either architect or do it, right? So that jack of all trades. I think both have strengths and weaknesses, and I, I think both can be outliers. So, but here's a question, Gus. If you were to say, could you name someone that you think is known for knowing a little bit of everything? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, the first person that came to mind for me was Richard Campbell because yeah, yeah. <laughs> every time I talk to him, I'm like, how do you know this? This is I, ridiculous. I, I, I would say Richard Campbell would be one. Um, there's probably a couple other ones out there that I can't think of right off the top of my head, but he would be one, definitely. Yeah, and I yeah. mean, part of that is the benefit of a huge amount of experience and also being extremely curious, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like, I don't know anything here. I'm going to just dive into it and learn it. And some people are naturally that way. And that's where you can find yourself, okay, you're a really good fit for somebody who should make themselves a really obvious general generalist and make yourself a name as somebody that knows the full stack of, and truly full stack. And, hey, I, I know about deployment systems and I know about languages and I know about databases. And it's just... Mm -hmm. uh, these no, days, there's so much to know. It's really hard to be truly broad. Yeah, and and in my field, or at least in the in the company that I'm working with right now, there aren't many. Seriously, um, and the generalists are the ones that they're looking for, 
right? The person that knows enough about everything to be able to architect it and or coerce it or look at it or troubleshoot it or or work it. Whereas oh, you well, can throw a UI guy in there, right? He knows yeah. UI, but if you ask him to fix data layer, it's forget it. Or like they, they say, hey, Gus, or, or, you know, like me and Corey are sitting there talking and we're business execs and we're like, you know, I think Gus knows something about MongoDB or just whatever, you know, and we're just like, hey, where's Gus? Like, you know, come in here. Why don't you talk to us because we're kicking around this idea. It's, it's, it's weird because it's that job, and this kind of goes into the, the next question that, that, that I have, which is um, why and, and what are the benefits of being, okay, if, if I'm going to be exceptional at the one thing, what, it, what would be bad about being um, really good at, like what Gus was saying, of all of these different areas so that you can be the guy that people go to to say, if we wanted to build a back-end services with X, you know, was it compatible with, you know, all these other uh, different kinds of languages and services? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a tough call. I guess one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is, are you someone that feels like you need self-control to stay within a certain area? Mm -hmm. um, or are you someone that feels like you need self-control to focus on a given area? And I, I'm one of those that I've always found myself really naturally curious. Um, so for me, the struggle is to stay fairly narrow. And I've I've tried really hard to to make um, to make a name for myself, especially in front end development. Um, even as somebody who does the full stack, because I just can't help myself. I'm like, oh, there's a new Rev of Entity framework. Yeah, I want to go toy with that too. Even though data access isn't, I don't make a name for myself there like Julie Lerman would, for instance. You know, I know I can't I can't keep up with everything there as well. Um, but but I mean, as as far as your question about why, why bother at all? Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of great reasons to strive to be exceptional. I, I, I can also see, though, how with a job market that is as strong as, as it is in a lot of different technologies, it's hard to justify striving to be really good because you don't have to be amazing to be employed, and you don't have to be amazing to make, you know, pretty good money, too. Um, but, but for me, I find being really good at something is its own reward. And, and it is yep. just, it's a lot of fun feeling like you have mastered something and, and having somebody drop by your desk and ask a question and being able to answer it off the top of your head, that's a great feeling. And, and but, it's a lot of work to be in that role in, at your job, but gosh, it's cool. And I, I, I just find that is naturally rewarding. Totally agree. 100%, million percent. Yeah, like when I, when, I, when I score on a function or something, or if I tied something together, I'm like, yeah! People are like, oh, dude, you know, <laughs> I'm like no, dude, you don't understand. So I run around and tell everybody. Um, this is what I did, you know? And, and that's the type of person that I am, you know? But some, yeah. I recognize that some people aren't as intense as I am about those sorts of things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can be a little intense there, JJ. That's okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's, that's the good kind of intense, man. That's just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. I'll brighten your day for sure. I always <laughs> say, you know, I'm like a ray of freaking sunshine. You're up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what are some tips that you have to to have uh, or to help somebody become an outlier? Well, uh, so so one thing that is absolutely key is commanding your time, and and when I say that, I mean owning it and, and not letting other people dice up your day um, without your permission. And it, it is really easy. I remember doing this for a long time that I was somebody that had a hard time saying no. Um, I mean, I remember a, a good friend of mine was my roommate and he ended up one night sitting at home waiting for an insurance salesman to come by the house and he was just dreading it. He's like, I'm not going to buy the insurance, but now I've got to sit here and then I've got to listen to him talk for an hour and a half and then i got to try to tell him no in the end. And it's just... If, if you're not comfortable with saying no, then you're going to find that people start to dice up your day with all sorts of things. So um, a good way to avoid that is to just be very, very clear about what your mission is and what, what tasks in your day are really going to help you get there. And so for me, I know I want to be a great dad. I have three kids. I, I'm, it's really important not to me that while they're awake, when I'm home, I get time with that. Right. Uh, but then once they're asleep, I know, okay, now I've got some time in the evening. It's quiet. Um, and now I've got a little bit of time to read and to study and to try to practice new things. So this this idea of, of setting good habits and thinking about what you can do in your free time is key and, and sort of thinking through what is your default mode. 
Um, and that, that's a story that I tell. I mean, I remember getting out of college, and I would come home each day, and I would sit down on the couch and turn on the TV and eat potato chips. And I just, I just loved doing that. I was like, yes, I'm off work now. I'm just chilling out. And it, and it's really easy to look over and realize that two hours have gone by. Oh, totally. And, and it's just once you get into that slot, it's really hard to get out of it and go do something else. And I wasn't exercising because I sat down and did that first. And then it's hard to get up and go get mobile and do these things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, habits are a huge piece of it so, for sure. So so to build on that question a little bit, um, I'm actually uh, curious to hear what you have to say, but how do you prioritize? So for example, there's only so many hours in the day, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, there's always something that you need to learn, a plug-in or a, a call or whatever the, whatever the situation may be is. How do you prioritize, you say, do you think big scale or, or how, how does your process work? Because mine, I feel like sometimes I get stuck in this okay, I'm going to tackle this problem, and now it's a whole thing, and it's completely mm -hmm. taken over other projects that I really needed to get done. Um, how would you say to prioritize? Like, what's your, is it money first, or is it knowledge first, or how would you say that is? Yeah, wow, that's, um, so, so that's something that I don't think anybody ever arrives. They're constantly trying different things and seeing what works. I mean, I can say in just the last few weeks, I've started leaning heavier on Trello just as a way to just brain dump and say, here's another good idea. Here's a blog post I want to do. Here's a Pluralsight course I want to write. Here's a, another conference I might want to submit to. And you just start getting everything out of your head. And then you can start dragging and dropping and saying, all right, this one's higher priority than this, or this is um, a little more time sensitive than others, and that helps me. Um, but, but I mean, I can also say, up until very recently, I've believed in what Jeff, Jeff Atwood preaches, which is um, if you need a to-do list that, that shouldn't really be necessary. I mean, he's very much against the idea of a to-do list, which I find interesting because on any given day, we probably know what we should be doing. Sure. And the things that are most important just come up and slap us in the face and you go, well, I've got to do this now. I, I know I need to do it. I mean, outside of these little things of making sure that you don't forget about a deadline. Those are necessary to have into your calendar, but um, priorities are so much in flux that we can spend too much time fiddling with the tool rather okay. than okay. Sure. getting things done, right? And I find myself sometimes doing that already in Trello because I have friends that really like Trello, and so I've been trying that out here lately. Um, yeah, and it's T-R-E-L-L-O for people because actually um, Dave... Uh, yesterday, when I was learning about Connect for uh, Windows, uh, I, went, I was the Microsoft Virtual Academy. I was watching that up at the the offices. Uh, he was showing me Trello, and I'm like, "This is this is really intense. I like this a lot, um, and and very cool. And 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 like you said, that is very difficult to do because why have to do this at all? You know what you have to do, and and that's really because. Some things do pop up that you're like, man, I could, I can make a little bit of money here if I set maybe something aside or whatever. Because as devs, side projects are just they come out of the woodwork sometimes, and <laughs> that's you know, a great like, problem to have. Yeah, it really is, and 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 managing that. So I was just kind of curious to see where um, and, and how you approach those different things, just from a personal perspective and from maybe a listener's perspective. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one other thing on this topic. Um, there's a book uh, called Rework uh, by uh, DHH and Jason Freed, and there's a line out of there that really hit me with a ton of bricks, and they said that inspiration is perishable. And I think that's a really powerful point, because how many times have you been sitting there, like, in the car, and you thought, oh, that would be such an awesome blog post, and you're all fired up to write it, but you get home, and then you get busy with these other things, and a few days later, you're just not you're just not stoked up about it anymore. It doesn't sound as interesting. And if you had went right at that minute and said, okay, I know this other thing that's important that I need to do, I'm going to shelve that because right now I am passionate about writing this post on Blurg, whatever it may be. Okay, sure. And you fire it out really quickly. And it may not be your best post, but I can tell you the, the highest post, the best post that I've ever had as far as views by far, five times the views of any of my other posts, was a post that I did in about 45 minutes. And I just hammered it out because I thought, you know what, I'm about to email somebody, but other people might be interested in this, so I'm going to do it in public, I'll post this up, and I'm kind of excited to get this just out there and off, uh, out of my head, right? Amazing. And then I ended up getting tens of thousands of views off of that, and that was something that I was just going to email someone. But because, of, because I was working when I was passionate about it and I was naturally interested, I fired off, um, I think, a, a pretty good post in a really short amount of time, and it would have taken... 
it would have likely never happened if I had shelved it and said, hey, I'll write this later. And self-discipline, sir. You must have some serious self-discipline. <laughs> 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 oh, that's awesome. All right, Gus, you're up. Uh, all right. <clears throat> um, so are there any outlier developers that you actually uh, find inspirational? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I got to meet one of them uh, in uh, Oslo, Norway, when I was at NDC. I got to meet uh, Uncle Bob Martin, uh, oh. and I was super excited about that, and we got to chat about uh, code and TDD and all sorts of things. And I mean, as far as... I, and I got to shake his hand and tell him that he was one of the people that had probably affected the quality of my code more than anybody else. It's just... It is so cool to have people that you that you look up to and, and also get to meet them and find out, wow, and they're really nice people too. They're they're genuinely nice people. Um so so he's one of those. I mean, also on on the um on the coding side, Jeff Atwood is another person that I really respect. I mean, especially um him and Spolsky getting out there and launching Stack Overflow and doing it quickly, uh, and then also accepting that they weren't um they weren't going to gold plate their software. I mean, they did things like, we're just going to use Link to SQL and get this thing out the door, even though Link to SQL wasn't the most scalable solution, and it ended up meaning that they were using the active record pattern, for instance, which a lot of people say, well, that means that you're not going to be able to um, unit test your uh, business layer particularly easily because it's going to mix your data access and your business logic together. And it's like, dude, we just got to get this out the door. If we get to a problem of scalability then that is the best problem we could have in the world. And that was exactly what happened to them. They launched and got it out there. So I, I really, um, I tend to especially look up to developers who also have a business savvy. And, and that is really rare. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that are awesome, awesome at coding, but have no interest in business. And then there's a separate set of people that are amazing at business, but don't really have any interest in technology. So these people that end up intersecting the two are extremely powerful, and they end up really being able to build a following and change the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's something I talk about a lot is the secretary versus salesman, right? So um, uh, I, I, you probably have come across to this where somebody, like you said, is business savvy, more sales, more conversational sees maybe a bigger picture to it, not that the coder doesn't or the clerical person doesn't, but there's this very set of rules that they follow, being a secretary or clerical work. And I've always said if you can make those two come together and, and have best of both worlds, then, then you, like you said, it could be just, you could be a force to be reckoned with, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. So, Corey, in, in your normal day, what are some of the things that you do to continue to be an outlier? Uh, I, I'd say the most important thing that I do is multi-thread my life. Uh, this is this is a term that I came up with to try to separate from the idea of multitasking. Um, and I say that because multitasking has gotten this bad rap of being uh, really doing two things badly. Uh, <laughs> and I and I and I get that. There's a lot of things like I'm. I don't suggest that you do anything while you're coding. Don't put on a movie. Don't try to watch a TED talk or whatever it may be. Just code, right? Right. But there are a number of points during your day when you're doing something that really doesn't take much brain power. Maybe you're doing the dishes, maybe you're cleaning the garage, or you're mowing the yard, or you're on your commute to work, um, or maybe I'm out shoveling snow, whatever it may be. Those are areas where your brain is more or less in neutral, and you can spend that time to just kind of think and meditate, um, but you can also spend that time listening to really good content. And I'd say that is, has radically improved um, my knowledge because... There's so many podcasts out there. And then I've also started just going out to uh, the library and checking out books on CD. Because I, I found I learn, you have to figure out how you learn best. I learn coding best by watching uh, videos online or by reading books. I find it harder to learn coding principles with just audio. Right. Um, so, so for me, I end up um, listening to more audio books that are business-oriented, communications-oriented. It, it's... it's um, it's to each his own, but you've got to figure out what what format works for you and then start hacking those things. But nonetheless, I mean, there's this huge amount of time that we have every day where we're really just kind of chilling out. Um, and, and during that period, you can end up injecting good content. you just got to have it queued up and convenient. That is amazing news. I hope that everybody totally takes that to heart. I'm a, you know, and I'm not trying to plug Pluralsight, but I, but I do, I, I have a subscription, and I do learn more so from a community, like, a, it, it's, it's kind of, it's difficult for me to say, let's say this, I learn 
while watching somebody do it, right? So mm -hmm. Pluralsight's a really good way for me if I'm not already, like, at a user group or something like that, right, where, like, I'm like, dude, whoa, how did you just do that? Like, stop the thing you're doing right now and show me how to do that. So it's, it's like, it's, it's stuff like that that really keeps me engaged. So it's hard for me, like, uh, some, some people that I know like the, the book uh, method, right, like the being downloaded um, content, like in PDF form, and very kind of structural and that kind of thing. I don't like that because... It, it almost never, ever, ever works like it says it's going to, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't. Um, so, and I'm not addition books. I'm just saying this is a personal thing. How, um, what what uh, resources would you say for somebody like me to, uh, who have my type of, of learning and content, what resources should I uh, be involved in other than Pluralsight? Uh, so other than Pluralsight, InfoQ is awesome, and you can sign up for InfoQ, and they will send you an email about once a week. And what InfoQ does is they go around to conferences all over the world, and they record conference speakers, and they get a really good shot of their uh, slides, too. And then they email those uh, email links out to these conference uh, presentations on a regular basis, and I've just found really good quality in there because they're pretty picky about who they're going to record, too. Oh. I'm also kind of bumped out because they never recorded me, but at some point I'll... I'll Surely get an opportunity, I hope. I will start bombarding them tomorrow. <laughs> Why isn't Corey on here? Thank you. That was my whole intent to coming here, is if I could get your help. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm sure, yeah. Wow, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. And I mean, so, so they're awesome. And then I've also found uh, TED Talks, which a lot of people I'm sure have heard of. Is mm -hmm. It's not really programming related, but uh, it's just so many different ways to really make you rethink uh, the world. And uh, that's... That's an opportunity um, also, of course, with books. But those are the big three as far as in the video space that I hit. I mean, there's a number of others out there like egghead.io um, that, that are also useful. Um, and, and, of course, like I used to use TechPub before Pluralsight bought them out. And there's starting to be a lot of consolidation uh, in that space. And there are always, if, if you can monetize something, you're going to see some other company go, well, well, you know, just the bigger fish, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so the way that I've found time to watch more of these things, too, is I work out at night. I bought a gym-grade elliptical. My wife and I went out. We dropped a couple grand on this thing, which I thought was an absurd amount of money when you look at what gym uh, memberships cost. But mm -hmm. the beauty of it is I can go downstairs, and I can set my laptop up there, and I will watch InfoQ or Pluralsight or TED Talks or uh, stream some video on YouTube that looked interesting. And... That is really good content, and I'm finding it easier for me to stick to working out because I look forward to watching the content that's queued up there. You know, if it's something I really, really don't want to watch, then I'm not going to watch it while working out. I want something that's really engaging and interesting to me. But that's yeah. a good way to make it um, to incentivize yourself and and make it more fun. Yeah. So I noticed. Are you at a standing desk now? Yes. Yes, I am. So um, we hit each other back and forth on Twitter. I don't know if you remember that, but mm -hmm. I was like, what? Uh, standing desk do you say and you like hit me up with some links and stuff so it inspired me I did it for like two weeks and then I had to do a whole bunch of other stuff and now I'm in the market again so, oh, okay. uh, so I'll be definitely checking that out but um, my where I'm going with this is it's interesting because I hopped on the bike and I was just listening to music because I have a recumbent because I have some some stuff wrong with kind of my back and knee so I gotta be on the recumbent bike or whatever but I'm sitting there and I'm just listening to music and the time didn't seem to go by very fast. I'm like, what's going on? But I queue up some videos, right? And then the next thing you know, I'm already laps. And I'm yeah. like, whoa, this is crazy. So if you, you know, if you can keep your mind busy like that in, in, in a productive way, a constructive way, then that helps to uh, continuously make it better, for sure. Oh, yeah. It, it's really helpful if you're someone like me that like, the minute that I get on an elliptical or a treadmill and that sort of thing, the first thing I think about is turning it off. But yeah. if I can if I can distract <laughs> myself with right. something engaging, then right. I won't I won't think about what I'm doing, and it's just now I'm focused on the video, and I will keep going until the machine beeps at me, and that uh, that really helps me avoid that. Sarah, my wife was so scared because I was I was watching I, because at the time we had a treadmill, and I was running on the treadmill and watching videos on my phone, and she's uh -huh. like, "How are you able to do that at the same time?" I was like, "This is how I consume content." Yes. <laughs> I love it. So you're up, Gus. 
I think oh, you're muted, Gus. I think you're muted. Well, let's wait for him to come Sorry. back. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Technical difficulty. So, uh, Corey, what is the one simple change that every one of our listeners could do to help their accelerate their career, whether it be in development or anything else? One simple change. Um, well, okay, I would suggest this. Uh, think about a habit that you want to pick up in your life <clears throat> and then set an aspirational password. Um, I came across this very recently, and I think this is so powerful. You think about how many times during the day you walk up to your machine and you type the password in to get into it, right? Especially at work if you lock it every time. Because at least in my job, if we don't lock it, then people send out emails about how we love pie and all sorts of oh, <laughs> random garbage, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but somebody told the story, and he, he said um, he, he'd gotten a divorce, and he was really angry at his ex-wife, and he realized that he needed to forgive her. And so his technique to do that was uh, to change his password to forgive her now. And he had to type that every day, multiple times a day, and he found that it really helped him for finally forgive her. And so in the same token, we all have things we want to change in our lives. Like maybe I want to uh, start doing Pomodoros for 30 minutes. So I want to change my password to 30-minute Pomodoro. And every time I log in, it's reminding me, oh, I should set my Pomodoro timer for 30 minutes, and now I'm going to be heads down and really be focused for the next 30 minutes. Um, so whatever it may be, may maybe you're someone who I want to speak for the first time. So submit my first call for papers to a conference. If that's your password, you might want to shorten that one a bit, come to think of it. But, but the, this idea, because the, the, the thing is, we, we often hear about good content, and we go, yeah, that's probably something I should do. But if you don't immediately set something into action about it, then it's highly unlikely you're going to change your life. But this is something that all I have to do is change the password, and it will keep reminding me to do it. Yeah. And, and not only set it in, in motion, but for, for the most part, write it down so you remember it so you can set it in motion if you can't do it immediately. I mean, that's what a lot of people don't do is write notes and make sure that they remember things, right? Because we all forget things fairly quickly. There's so much happening around us these days that, you know, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've started using uh, Evernote as my, basically, my assistant brain. And, and anything that I need to get out of my head, I throw into Evernote, or if you're someone that likes OneNote, same sort of story, right? You yep. need something that just lets you get all of these thoughts out right. and then tag it, and it's searchable later. Uh, but you need something really low friction to, to get it out there. So if I go to a conference or... If I'm um, driving down the road, sometimes I will literally pull my car over and I'm like, I've just got to get this thought out of my head. And I'll type it with my thumbs into Evernote and it's done and now it's there and I can think about it later. Uh, yeah. But At least yeah, you relying. Said <laughs> 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 well, yes, you guys always pull over too, right? You never oh, type oh, yeah. your phone. Every time. Actually, actually yeah. what I do, and I know, and I'm not just saying this, but I, I record my, I do a voice record inside OneNote because it has that feature. So I'm driving down the road, and if I have that thought, I just hit record, and it just keeps that band. Yeah, so I, I've been doing that in um, in Gmail, and, and this is, I'd love to hear what people's thoughts are on this. I will fire up a Gmail draft anytime I have something random to do, and then I'll hit the microphone button and just talk to my phone, and it does a pretty good job on dictation. But the reason I find Gmail drafts really useful is I can go back a day or two later on anything not time-sensitive and go, okay, here's what I was doing. Now I have to think about where should I do this? Maybe this is a blog post I need to go start, or maybe this is a conference submission, or maybe this is an app I need to go write. So the data goes in all these different directions, but mm -hmm. by having this centralized, super low friction place to just dump thoughts, that's useful. And I, and I hesitate to put those sorts of things in Evernote, just or OneNote, if you will, because it might get lost. Like There's not a really good system there for saying... Um, show me the ones that I really haven't triaged yet. So I use oh, my oh. Gmail drafts that way. Oh no, that's that 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 totally sounds like some because what, I I have a tendency to work it down, right? Like I'll go to the top and then I'll start putting stuff, and then the next thing you know, I'm like, oh, now I'm infinite. <laughs> <laughs> my list of to dos, you know, and 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 you know, the time sensitive thing is mixed with something that isn't, and it's a whole thing. So yeah, I totally get that. And I, I'm going to start doing that. That's a, that's a good idea. It really is. It's a good workflow. And developing a good workflow, that, that's something that maybe we haven't talked about too much yet, is, is to have a pattern and stick to it for a while. Develop a good habit. I was yeah. telling somebody this the, the other day, um, develop a habit 
to where you just you just you you code a line a day or you write something a day or whatever the case may be is before you go to bed you do this like a number of things and you just make yourself do it and and that routine can be very uh, uh, helpful when you're trying to structure other routines. Yeah, well, closely related to that was uh, John Rezig had a tip recently that he was wanting to do a little bit of coding on a project on the side, and he just set up just a hard and fast rule. He's like, I will commit every single day. And maybe that means I only wrote two lines and then I committed. But if every single day you're committed to at least doing a little bit of something, you've kept that habit alive. And, right. and sometimes that's like, oh, I, I can't exercise today because I don't have the 30 minutes or the hour that I need to do my full workout. But I'm going, well, did you have five minutes in there to at least do something and keep some kind of a habit alive? Right. Uh, because, yeah, every day is not perfect, but every day you can probably shoehorn in a little bit of time to, to keep a rhythm going. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, totally, <clears throat> totally agree with that. So uh, I'm going to kind of rewind back just a little bit and ask you, you know, having three kids and everything, how do you actually fit time into your day to do all this stuff? <laughs> so I mean, I, <laughs> I have my day... Well, I mean, there's been a number of things I've done. I, I work from home uh, a couple days a week, and that has given me more time with my family because now at lunch, before I was going out to lunch with my team, now at lunch I, I sometimes, like, I'll go with my kids to the pool and we'll go hang out for an hour right in the middle of the day. And that is really refreshing to have that option if you can. And I, I encourage everybody, have a conversation with your boss to see whether you can work from home like a couple days a week, just on a trial period. And Tim Ferriss is somebody that really emphasizes this too. Don't try to go whole hog and say, can I never come to the office again? Yeah. Because you're probably going to get a no. Yeah. I don't want to work pants. I just, yeah. I just don't want to work pants. <laughs> Do I have to wear a shirt? Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. So, I mean, that that's one thing that's really helped me cause, because also that means that, that I, I spend about an hour round trip on my drive. So that's an hour that I've gotten back on those days that I work from home. And then you're the other more productive, and you're a little bit more energized to knock out things that you may not have gotten done if you had to come. To <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it, it also comes down to, um, you know, figuring out what really energizes you. Something that energizes me is having variety in my day, and by that I mean not just variety in the things that I'm building, but variety in my location. When mm. I work from home, I will spend the afternoon at the coffee house. I'll spend some of the morning at my standing desk here at my office. I'll usually spend part of the day out on the deck in the morning when the sun's rising and you're just sitting there with the coffee and it's very zen and quiet, and I can write some of my best work right there where there's just really no interruptions, and I'm just really happy to be in that spot. Mm. And those sorts of things are just really rewarding um, and help me because I feel like the one of the most important things you can do if you want to have more free time to get better is make sure that the time that you spend at work is really valuable because, I mean, I, I will tell you this, I used to work 60 hours a week, and when I went for my latest job, I was very candid with them. I'm like, I'm going to be pretty much 40 hours a week. There's been a couple points that I've had to do a little extra, but mm -hmm. I'm able to do that because they know when I'm there, I am flat getting things done. I'm not standing around just chilling out. Uh, and it's not that I'm I'm totally rigid to that, but people know that I'm 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 not just surfing the web. I want to come in every day and knock things out because I know I've got to leave on time. I have a family mm -hmm. at home and other other things that that I I want to get done. And that's probably true of a lot of people, but it's it's easy to, to forget that when you're chilling out at the office. Absolutely. And and you pick up bad habits sometimes at the office. I've noticed people pick up bad habits of uh, of of hitting those two o'clock uh, you know, that 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 lull, right? And you, the productivity goes down and there's gotta be some type of way to to better um, uh, use your time and keep you excited and keep you productive and things like that. I know this question is in the show notes, but this has been, I, you're the kind of guy to ask this question because I actually asked this question to a couple people yesterday, which is being an outlier, being exceptional, doing things, all the stuff that we talked about tonight, where would you, where would you say um, to direct people who, because Gus to me is, is a mentor. A lot of the things that I do, I, I go to him and I say, hey, what do you think of this or all this other kind of stuff because he knows a lot, yeah? And why not listen to people who know what they're talking about? And for me, I, I, I always find myself sometimes talking to other people who just graduated college and stuff like that as long, uh, with me. 
which is where do we put our, um, our, our mindset? Where do we focus on our time? Is it Java? Is it C Sharp? Is it .NET? Is it Azure? Is it database management and all this kind of stuff? The question is, is where would you tell somebody like me or like others like me, where should we put our collective time, free time to learning uh, specific either languages or, or structures or whatever the case may be is? Boy, that's a that's a tough one um, because there's there's a couple things there. You you have a decision to make about your media format, right? And that's right. going to be a very personal decision uh, because I know people that can really only seem to learn well by practicing and by by uh, basically reverse engineering. Th these are people that would go out to GitHub and say, "Okay, I want to learn Node, so I'm going to go find a big project made in Node, and I'm just going to start fiddling with it and looking at what they did and reverse engineering the whole thing." I'm just going to break it. <laughs> I'm just yeah. and, and fix and, it. And, right. And I'm, I'm sort of one of those people, too, that learns best by example. So mm -hmm. I can read through the docs, but what I really want to do is see a working one and then start changing it and saying, oh, okay, when I did that, they wouldn't build okay. anymore. So right. why was that wired that way? And so I make those connections. Uh, I find being more interactive really helps me. Um, but but on, on the same token, you can really accelerate your learning by understanding the basics up front. And to me, the, the easiest way to understand the basics up front is something like Pluralsight. It is awesome for introductory type things. Um, when, I, when I have to go really advanced and dive deep, that's when I don't prefer Pluralsight anymore and I prefer um, a combination of a deep dive book and then just personal, just toying around with an example app, that sort of thing. Totally. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, everybody has their, their own setups. I mean, I, I thought that you were headed down the road of, of sort of mentorship as well when you were mentioning Gus and, and the help that he has that was, there. And that, that was actually going to be my next thing. <laughs> well, so, sure. and I, I mean, I've thought about that is I, one thing I wouldn't recommend is ever asking anybody to be your mentor um, because that's a really long-term commitment and it sounds rather challenging. Um, and instead, what I'd recommend is, Take somebody who you really respect and ask if you can buy them a beer or buy them lunch because you just wanted to talk some tech and you, you, you're you not real sure where to go in your career. And, I mean, I've been really lucky to have had um, people in town like Lee Brandt and John Mills that helped get KCDC together that I've been able to become really good friends with that have helped mentor me. Right. Um, and we get to throw ideas off of each other. And, and really just help, um, I mean, we find out things like, hey, here's this conference I submitted to. Well, I didn't even know about that one. Because uh, there's, there's a lot of information out there. If we would just um, be more connected with people that we look up to, then we can find ourselves um, getting to enjoy a lot of that information and, and also just have a back and forth, share with each other. Yeah, that's the kind of relationship that me and Gus have. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> exactly, yeah, right up there. Um, I haven't bought him a beer yet, uh, but I will. <laughs> uh, but uh, but no, we collectively kind of learn together. You know, we we uh, we kind of jump into stuff, and, and it's and it's a lot of fun, especially doing this kind of show. But but I think I, I do think that having somebody that actually gives a crap about you um, <laughs> helps you get on the right path, right? Instead of feeling so kind of left to your own devices, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of the times, uh, people. Um, feel a little isolated, um, especially in this field, from their significant others if they're not in the same field. Mm -hmm. So they can't um, uh, express maybe or communicate those different, like, hey, I did this today, and, and I'm dealing with this right now. Well, no one knows what the hell you're talking about, <laughs> you know, besides <laughs> the people who know what's going on. So I, I find it good to have some uh, one that I can kick stuff around with um, like that. And I, and I would suggest people find these groups and find these individuals who are willing to take the time to give a crap about you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that, that is a great one. <clears throat> so to transition towards the end of our show here, Corey, uh, I always ask this question. Um, what do you do away from the keyboard? Do you have any hobbies and passions other than cars? <laughs> <laughs> Other than cars, yeah. Uh, so I am a really bad golfer and have been for a lot of years. And, and this is another one of those emphasis of I'm really bad because I've never gotten lessons and I never do deliberate practice. I go out there and I hit the ball for 18 holes and I go home and I don't really reflect about it. I just really enjoy it. Uh, and it's, uh, I highly recommend it for anybody that hasn't tried. My dad picked up golfing at 50-something and I, I asked him if he wanted to go golfing one day and I thought he was going to go, what? Golfing? And he goes, 
well, all right, let's try it. Turns out he loves it. So it's a, it's a really good way to spend time with, with your dad, too. Uh, so I've, uh, I've really enjoyed that. Or your mom, if she's into golfing. My mom, that's not her thing. Uh, so I do that. And then um, I'm also big into photography. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time on this. And even for a while, thought about going into photography full time. Uh, but I still like software more. So one of them had to rule out. Uh, and so these days, my photography consists of trying to capture the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's so, so what oh, yeah. kind of camera do you have? Uh, I have uh, an older one now. I have a Nikon D40, uh, but I do have, I'm a believer in spending money on glass rather than on bodies, so I have like a $1,000 uh, f2.8 zoom that is just awesome, and it weighs a ton, but it is a beautiful lens, and you can shoot really well in low light and get really good bokeh, and, and yeah, I could throw out all sorts of the usual photography jargon I get off on that side, but yeah, I, I enjoy the photography side of things for sure. Our yeah, two feet Alejandro would probably be all over this conversation for sure because yeah, he loves that crap. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing better than a good digital SLR. I'll tell you that, that changed my life totally. Yeah, I'm due for an upgrade in a big way because I bought this one when my first son was born, so uh, this is about six years old now. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations yeah. on the family, sir. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, go uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so where can people find, where can our audience find out more about you, what you do, and, and, and how you do it, and that sort of thing? Well, this whole conversation, uh, I created a, a companion site for the Pluralsight course uh, at outlierdeveloper.com, and my idea there was to go out there and have a place where people could set goals based on the course itself, and I really believe that you, you can hear all this stuff, and if you don't set a couple specific goals and start trying to move on them, then it, it really didn't do you any good. It sounded like good advice, but you have to put it into action, right? So that was something that was important to me. Like I'm also them in January and then just letting it <laughs> <go>. <laughs> Yep. Yes, exactly. And I'm also a big believer that people need to get into um, blogging if they haven't, that it's a great way to... to um, really force yourself to justify your own thoughts and, and also speaking as well. So I've um, opened up guest blogging on the outlierdeveloper.com site and I've had a bunch of people submit uh, guest posts. That's been a whole lot of fun. Got another one I'm going to publish uh, probably tomorrow night um, by someone. So that's a good way to just get involved and also if you already have a blog, draw attention to your own because we have hundreds of people that have already signed up on the mailing list that get notified when new posts go out. Cool. Uh, and, and then I have my own blog at uh, bitnative.com where I, I tend to blog mostly about uh, .NET stuff and then a lot of stuff on the front end with uh, JavaScript frameworks, those sorts of things. Nice. Cool. That's awesome. That's totally awesome. Yes. We will definitely have all of these links in the show notes for people to click and go when they want to go to our website and check it out before they get to yours. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. Yeah. You were you were upset. <laughs> so one last question of you, um, and we'll get off of here. But um, what technology do you see changing in the next three to five years? Well, as I've said, I'm I'm pretty front end oriented, and the huge trend that I see is people moving toward front end development and away from server side development. And we've seen Ember and Backbone and Angular and Knockout and Durandal, all these different frameworks that are helping slice and dice this, but the real change that I'm seeing that's going to just blow things out is this idea of evergreen browsers and people saying, I'm only going to write applications for browsers that auto-update. And this idea is becoming really popular, and once we get there, we're going to see things radically advance in the web space. So I'm expecting to see less interest in native mobile apps and a lot more interest in plain old HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS applications. Because now that we have JavaScript's finally growing up, ECMAScript 6 is really strong, so we have all the power we need now to really do amazing things on the web. And that's really exciting to me because that's where I've invested my time to. So it's good to see uh, all, all this uh, exciting tech coming down the pike here soon. And you're like, not this time. Not <laughs> <laughs> <All> this time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, JJ, do you have any announcements? I do have some announcements, sir. I'm going to be um, at the uh, Strange Loop conference. I'm also going to be at St. Louis Days of .NET this year. Uh, we're also going to be covering some other uh, local events, some uh, St. Louis uh, JavaScript, Java groups, MongoDB, some other stuff, all sorts of stuff coming up. But uh, totally looking forward to it. So if anybody wants to follow more about what I'm doing, 
Uh, you can follow me at JJ Hammond Music on Twitter. That's just literally that's, that's the best way to follow uh, what I'm doing and what I got going on. Plus, we got videos that we're going to start posting like mad crazy from user groups and, and different stuff like that because we've opened a media arm of STL Tech Talk where we're going to be recording conferences and, and interviews and, and different stuff like that. So thank you for throwing me that. Now back to you, Gus. What do you got coming up? Uh, well, next week we have Lee Brandt coming on to talk about some MongoDB. Speaking of MongoDB, um, that should be kind of interesting. We'll also probably touch base on the KCDC uh, outlook for next year and everything else uh, that way. Uh, that way. Uh, next month, I am going to be at that conference, and uh, I believe it's Baraboo, Wisconsin. Anyway, it's in Kalahari in Wisconsin Dells. That's August 11th through the 13th, and uh, Dev Connections in September. I'll be there the 15th through the 19th. I'll actually be there the entire conference, I believe. So, uh, Corey, do you have any coming up? Yeah, I'll get to see you, uh, Gus, at that conference. I'm looking forward to that one. And uh, I'm also going to uh, DevLink just a couple weeks after that uh, out in Chattanooga. I'm, cha I'm jealous of that one. I wanted to go to that one, but maybe next year. We'll, we'll I've see how heard goes. really good things. Uh, I had a number of people tell me that's their favorite, so I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much both for uh, everything you do, and thanks for being on the show. Um, Corey, we, we greatly appreciate it, sir. Thanks for having me, guys. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Corey, I, I have to second that. I, I enjoy talking about outliers and, and careers and stuff like that, so this was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Any final words? Corey, got anything? Nothing? You caught me tongue-tied at the very end. No, I. Uh, it's like I had a great time, guys. We'll, we'll make me. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. So, right. uh, having said that, uh, from the entire STL Tech Talk crew uh, and from the entire Codecast side, uh, we love and thank you to our fans. We appreciate uh, everybody's downloads. Are we're we're looking really good. We're growing as a business. We're we're just there's so many good things happening for us. We can't thank you all enough. Uh, so thank you for listening to the show. Again, Corey, thanks for being on. So from the entire STL Tech Talk crew, good coding. We're out. Yeah, take care. <laughs>